The Fitness Movement is brought to you by Zor Fitness. We offer coaching and individualized program design, as well as educational content for coaches and athletes. It's all one place, ZorFitness.com. Well, welcome everyone to our Halloween episode. Ooh. 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 <laughs> I missed, sorry, I missed my cue. Because <laughs> today we're going to be talking about skeletons, uh, training skeletons, that is. So I guess, first of all, do you, do you guys call them skeletons? Yeah. I just you call it a template, template, but template. Yeah, that's what I, yeah. Template, I not like template. Skeletons. Template, template. So I, I always used to call them skeletons. Uh, templates and not that that's wrong it's just that i think sometimes people get confused with it being a templated program because mm -hmm. you say you're using a template so i just switch to skeleton mm -hmm. that makes sense yeah because yeah we're, we're going to be talking individual design uh training so it's like it, it's essentially like the outline of the week uh what you'd be seeing on the back end as you go to program design for athletes and it's it's basically like the the big priorities are concepts or progressions that would be in play for the athlete. And then you're using that and you're essentially taking that skeleton and putting the meat on it. So yeah, it's, it's the stripped down, no, no meat on the bone version. We're the meat builders. <laughs> We're the meat builders. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, so really quickly, let's talk through, um, maybe considerations for a skeleton. And then we're going to go through some examples, real athletes of ours that we will kind of walk through the skeleton, why that that coach laid it out the way they did. And we'll go through three different examples, one for each of our coaches. So mm -hmm. first of all, um, what big picture considerations do you need to think about while you're creating a skeleton? If you're sitting in front of a, a blank cells, you know, Monday through Saturday of a training week, what do you need to put in there? I think that's where most of the uh, like information where you get through conversation with the athlete comes from. How long have they been training? How much can they afford to train per week? What does their lifestyle, work, life balance look like? How many times a week do they normally train? Background information, age, all that good stuff. Yeah, I kind of start with, you, like I try to be pretty systematic about it. So like the first thing is like, well, what are their goals? So it's like, okay, these are the things you want to accomplish. All right, those are going to have to be in the programming from week to week, right? If I want to get better at bar muscle-ups and I don't put bar muscle-ups in your weekly skeleton, I'm kind of doing you a disservice there, right? So what are your goals? That's the first thing. Then the next thing, like Day said, is like, okay, well, what's your schedule? Okay, and that could be, you know, what days do you train? What days are you looking to train? How long are you looking to train? What time of day are you looking to train? How often per day are you looking to train? So- Right. Because again, you could have a goal and there could be progressions for that. But if you only have an hour and you want to get better at squat cleans and I give you skills, drills and strength progressions for squat cleans that uh, I'm sorry, you want to get better at clean and jerks. And I give you an hour's worth of squat cleans. We're not going to get to the jerks that day. So I have to be cognizant of your, your, your time constraints. So that would be the second thing would be your, their schedule. And then based off the goals and the schedule, I start to outline where the priority items are going to go, like on those priority days. And then from there, I start to fill in either the accessory stuff to those goals or the ancillary stuff that's like, hey, we're going to want to maintain these things as we go through, right? So if I have an athlete who's a CrossFit athlete who maybe struggles with certain gymnastics movements, let's say, right? I'm not going to throw out all the weightlifting just because they're good at it, right? Because if you just don't do any snatching for eight weeks, you're probably not going to be in a position to snatch well at the end of eight weeks, right? So it's like, all right, I need to at least touch on the snatch to maintain that skill. So that's kind of how I would, I think about going through and, and creating a skeleton. Yeah, totally agree with everything you guys said. The only thing that I would maybe add to that, and it's not that Chris doesn't do this, he probably just didn't think about it, was like, to looking at their calendar for their year. So like, yeah, you know, you're finding the place where they're at now um, and evaluating like what things they want to work on now, but it's like, how do you get them from a to B to Z sort of thing where it's like, you also need that long-term picture in, in mind. Like, okay, I know you're going to compete in eight weeks from now. I know you're going to compete in open quarterfinals uh, 
you know, the, the CrossFit season come springtime. So it's like, okay, we maybe have like two peaks throughout the year. And then, uh, that's when it's like, okay, then it means that on the tail end of coming off of each one of those competitions, okay, we, we deload for a week to two, then it's like, okay, now we have eight to 12 weeks of limiter based work where we can let those skills that you are already proficient in and good relative to your competitive field. We can let this slide a little bit as long as we actually like, you know, drive the needle forward on the the things that are historically most challenging for, to move in the correct direction for you. Um, and like each one of us will maybe have a, well, we do, we, we select them this way. An athlete, our, our example will be like Chris's uh, athlete will be like more gymnastics, body weight, uh, movement limited athlete uh, days will be uh, more conditioning, uh, repeatability, stamina based, and then mine's going to be strength based. Um, and that all is also obviously one of the things that you're going to consider. One more thing that we kind of briefly just discussed that we would actually bring it up on the call was having a, a one versus a two week skeleton. Um, and all, it sounds like all of us use majority of the time, a one week skeleton. What are like the circumstances where you might not? So I'll, I'll go first then. So for me, circumstances where I might not, I'm going to keep it within the context of an, uh, of like someone who has athletic endeavors, right? Like you could really easily do it a B week with maybe someone who's just looking to do some body comp bodybuilding style stuff. But like, I'm going to put that to the side for now. I feel like those so, people are even more linear in my experience. Yeah, they can be. Uh, I, but I've used, I've used an AB week for like people who are like super new just to, Cause it's like, I can set you up with a progression, like a 12 week progress, like a 12 week workout and like really easily just say, Hey, you're doing three sets of this exercise every week or every other week. Mm. And every time you see it, you're going to use the same weight and try to push the rep range. So if you did eight, the first time you see it, try to do 10 the next time, try to do 12 the next time. And then you can can extend the progressions a lot further if it's biweekly way further. So you can like run it for like 24 weeks of like an A and B week. And it's only, yeah. you know, 12 weeks of one progression where if you did that 12 continuous weeks, the person would be so sick of, you know, yes. bicep curls by the time they got to, well, they probably wouldn't be sick of bicep curls, but they'd be so sick of I'm their never sick yeah, of not, bicep not curls, goblet no. squats that <laughs> they yeah. just want to vomit. Whereas if it's every other week that you come back to it, they still learn it and you can run the progressions really long. Yes. That's what you're getting those- Exactly. And those progressions can be super linear. Like you said, like, yeah. all right, Hey, week one, find a weight you can lift for eight reps and I'll give them a rep range. And then every week, just try to do more reps at that weight. And then when you can do the highest rep range at that weight with perfect form, now you add weight until you're back at the eight. So you, I could, you could, for a beginner, you can cycle through that for weeks and get good results. Um, so I said, I wasn't going to talk about that, but we did anyway. So thanks for that, Ben. Um, well, actually, I, I learned something. That was, that was a good there idea. You go. Yeah. No, th- then I was going to say, so like for a CrossFit athlete, I feel like more often than not an a b week or having some skills that are on an a b week tend to apply for me two different people one is a skill that's a maintenance skill so like for example if if i have an athlete who's re- who's needs to work on gymnastics and i want to work on a specific gymnastic skill i'm probably going to want to touch on that every week and let's say they're a really good squatter you know what i mean maybe i alternate weeks one week's a front squat one week's a back squat but we're only squatting one day a week right because they don't need to be squatting more than that. Um, so that's one way to do it. Another way is sometimes like with really high level CrossFit athletes, because it's like, A, there's so many skills you have to touch on and B, you can make progress in skills at for athletes that are super high level with almost less touches, right? Like, because they, they're athletic enough to retain, especially with gymnastics, they're able to retain those small nuanced skills way quicker than like an intermediate athlete. That's like, if I don't touch on this every week, it just, it goes away. Um, so I would say those are kind of two for me. Yeah. Interesting. I, uh, oftentimes if, if I have the the case that you just mentioned of like, we don't need to touch on this every week, but we, you know, at least we need to be touching on it like every other week, I'll usually put in like odd and even on the, the skeleton. So that way I know I'm like alternating weeks of like, we'll do that in class quite frequently too. It's like, okay, we'll snatch on this week, clean jerk on this week. And you just yeah. flip flop between those two. And I've, I've done that with athletes for just recently. I've done that for one or 
you know, probably two or three athletes for battery progression. So it's like the one week they're hitting clean jerks, the next week they're hitting snatches variations. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I agree. I, I will uh, often use a biweekly template for higher level CrossFit athletes as they get closer to the season. Um, and we just want to touch on more things. Yeah. Whereas off season, if it's more calculated and just a little bit less moving pieces in the program, because things are a little bit more controlled and I'm really trying to improve, um, you know, physiology of like one specific or, you know, a pretty narrow quality, then I want to make sure that we're actually improving that thing. And mm -hmm. the best way to do that is just touch on it pretty frequently, like every week. So, um, yeah, I find that that, that works well. And then the only thing that I'll add for like the biweekly, uh, skeleton that I really like is that I, I do this and I think you two are normally in the same boat where it's like most of the time I'm writing one week of training at a time for an athlete. Um, and if I have a biweekly template that allows me to have an entire week of feedback from the week prior, you know, even if I go on on a Tuesday and it's beginning of the week, I have an entire week beforehand to then be able to out the, the following week, the week after the one that they're currently doing. So I look at the B week results, the entire B week results to write the next B week because they're currently doing the A week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Day. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I'm very similar to you where I like to do it to get more touches on different movements. But one thing I also do too, is if we're trying to work on a movement where frequency tends to cause some nagging pain or anything mm. like that, I like to put it on alternating weeks. So we're still touching it um, at an appropriate like frequency where it's not getting lost in the mix, but not also not causing those nagging pains. So if someone has like elbow issues, every time so they say, is that like, ups, are you referring to like bring muscle up like rope climb or right? Exactly. Yeah. And then progress it through that way. And we could keep it a little longer in their program. Um, and hopefully navigate those issues that they may feel along with like, you know, prehab you right. And then I'll include like prehab type exercises like every week and all that. Mm -hmm. So that we address it that way. Yeah. That's a good point day. Cause it's like, that can get really tricky. And I feel like it's often where it's like, okay, I need to work on X skill to get better at my sport or specifically CrossFit. And it's like, but that's also the skill that gives me like joint pain. I feel like that's often the case, right? Because maybe your little muscle groups aren't super strong or you're compensating in certain ways to execute the skill. Whose muscle so, groups yeah. are you calling little? <laughs> <laughs> Mine right now. <laughs> um, like, like for me, like I was, when I was competing, I was squatting at least twice a week and my knees would get cranky, but it's like, like I would train with people that would go three months without back squatting and still hit 95% of their max if they went and hit I a hate single. you people I hate yeah you. <laughs> oh, it was it was infuriating Must be man. nice infuriating but yeah and then you have those nagging things that pop up so i think that's really cool that's a really good point there day yeah um why don't we let chris go first um there's probably other things that we could mention within this but i think a lot of the things that we talked about in terms of like how you'd slice it into your week we've also kind of covered in our Priority to say podcast. Um, I will link to it in the show notes. If people want to uh, check that out, it'd be a good like prequel to this episode. Um, mm -hmm. So Chris, give us a little background on the athlete and then walk us through what the, the skeleton was. Yeah. So for this athlete, uh, they came to me saying, Hey, you know, I want to work on certain gymnastic skills. So the ones they, they posed to me were specifically bar muscle ups, chest to bars and uh, rope climbs. Um, and handstand walk, sorry, four skills that, that this person was like, I really need to work on these four skills. Um, she's relatively strong. So, and, and a pretty good squatter. And so it's like, okay, I, I need to factor in these four skills and try to touch on them every single week. Sp unfortunately, three of those skills are all pulling upper body pulling based skills. So I kind of got to make sure they're separated and you're not doing them too close together. Otherwise you're fatiguing the same muscle groups. Um, handstand walk is somewhat, in my opinion, one, you could partner off of one of those because it's more like an upper body push stability type of, uh, upper body movement. Um, and then I tried to then include because she is a CrossFit athlete, um, you know, some weightlifting, uh, around, uh, the sport and kind of touching on those things, um, maybe in certain areas of the lift that she might be deficient in, 
uh, not deficient, but like not as good in. So like a great example is like, she, she's even pointed out, you know, for a clean and jerk, my clean is this, my jerk is this, but when I do both of them together, I, I have a really hard time hitting anywhere close to those numbers when they're standalone. So it's like, okay, cool. Well, I'm not going to work on a squat clean by itself or jerk by itself. I'm going to kind of work them in tandem. Um, and then her schedule is her training schedule is Monday, Tuesday, off Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So I have to work around that. And then in addition to that, she's also a gym owner. So, uh, it's important to her. And I, I, I do think as a gym owner, this makes sense that she takes class. She tries to take class one to two times per week. Um, and so I have to factor that in as well. Is that like when she sends me what the class schedule is, the day she would usually take it is every Thursday. And then most Mondays is like, okay, how do, how do, how are you going to scale class based on what we have the rest of the week? Or how am I going to move your priority stuff around the class to make sure we're still getting uh, pri uh, good touches that we want? So long-winded way to, to go about how I thought through the, the, the skeleton. And so what it boiled down to was our skeleton is Monday, we work on bar muscle ups and I throw an upper body pulling accessory work at the end of her session. And then in the middle, the, the, the meat between those two uh, buns is, uh, her class strength and class conditioning works. Cause like I said, she tries to get into class most Mondays. Um, so is that like two, she's doing it before class, she takes class and then does the accessories after class. Correct. Yep. Okay. Um, and again, right. We're working on gymnastics, but I, I feel that anytime, most times I should say that you have someone who is deficient or has issues with gymnastics, right? Like doing some sort of let's say upper body pulling or upper body pushing, uh, bodybuilding and going heavy into accessory work, I find is always really good because most people lack some of the, the strength in the angles to be good at gymnastics, right? So if I struggle with bar muscle ups, yes, there's a skill component to it. And I know based on the number of strict pull-ups she can do, she's plenty strong enough to be good at that movement. But at the same time, it's like building more strength. Actually, I got this from you, Ben. Ben said, there's nothing wrong with building a strength surplus, right? No one ever went into a gymnastics like, man, I am just too strong to do all these bar muscle ups. Like, so, uh, so being able to integrate those in, making sure she's strong enough there and stays healthy uh, is super important. Um, Tuesdays is where we kind of touch on some of her weightlifting. So right now I'm going through a progression where I'm doing three weeks of front squat and jerk and power cleans. And then the fourth week is testing a, is doing a heavy single of a squat clean and jerk. So kind of separating the movements, but making sure I'm partnering that like a heavy squat motion into a jerk, um, as well as, uh, trying to emphasize the power through a power clean. Um, and then every fourth week I touch on the movement itself with a heavy single. Um, we do handstand walk work and then we do, uh, hinging and upper body pushing accessory work. So that's Tuesday, Wednesday's off Thursday's class. Friday, we snatch and back squat. It's not Friday is pretty full. So we snatch, we back squat, we rope climb and we do chest to bars. Um, not ideal to have two skills in one day. Yeah. But However, almost like, <clears throat> sorry, they, they, no, no, go ahead. it's almost like, uh, it's almost like two and two, like yep. they, they, they pair together nicely. Right. Like yes. if you're, if you can squat snatch heavy, you don't need to warm up again to squat. If you can yes. rope climb, you don't really need to warm up to, to chest to bar. Exactly. Plus like the pulling angle on a rope climb is different than a chest to bar and bar muscle. Up, right. And so if I put the bar muscle up in the chest to bar on the same day, you could really fatigue that same pulling angle versus, okay. Hey, like you said, my pulling muscles are warm from the rope climbs, but the angles are different. So they partner together better. Um, and so that's Friday. And then Saturday we, we touch on some deadlifts. So in this section that I'm going through with her, I, I partnered it with uh, some some plyometric worth work, so she's doing deadlifts and and, and box jumps for height, um, and then we hit some uh, aerobic conditioning intervals with an emphasis on wall walks. Alternating weeks, here's an A B week. I alternate between handstand push ups and wall walks because she's gymnastically better at upper body pushing work than she is at pulling, um, and those are two skills you'll generally see in the sport. So I want to touch on those. Um, and then shoulder accessory work and gluten hip accessory work because she had a major hip surgery like a decade ago. So her hip can get cranky from time to time. So making sure I do accessory work for her hips and glutes is super important.
Yeah. Nice. I, I think that's a good example of like an athlete who, you know, they have a lot of practical constraints. Like I want to do glass. Um, mm-hmm. you know, I've limited time to train. Like it's a, it's a good realistic take for like what most people deal with. Like we, it's very rare that someone's like, Hey, here's my schedule. It's wide open. Do whatever you yeah. want. Right. And I'm also 18 and don't have any joint irritation. I've never had an injury. Like that's just not life. So it's no like stress the in the world. Nothing, nothing yeah. to worry about. Yep. No kids, no girlfriend, no, um, <laughs> bills to pay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, Day, do you have any, any comments on Chris's outline? I'm trying to think if I have anything. It sucks. <laughs> yeah, it sucks. No, I, um, I do think having, like you mentioned that she goes to class a few times a week. And I think that's an interesting approach. Cause like, I know I have a few, uh, athletes that do that as well. And I think that's a big thing with CrossFit athletes is they, a lot of them still want to be a part of the community and all that. And being able to be like, as a coach, understand that that's part of it and being able to work around it and make it work. Um, and having that conversation of like, okay, maybe go in a little earlier and touch on this and, um, do the class and then follow up with this and just being able to include that in there. Um, it could be challenging sometimes I find, at least for me, it's like, you know, there's going to be some interference. Like unless it's my gym. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Cause you know, what's going on. Right. And so like, you know, sometimes I'm like, okay, like we have this progression for, they need for body pressing strength. So I'm going to put that on Tuesdays on Wednesdays, they will go to class. And then next thing you know, Wednesday they're doing a heavy bench and it's like, yeah, crap no. um, no, that, that's so inevitable kind of and I, I feel like as long as you have that conversation like hey you are in charge of your training don't do anything stupid right like i yeah. um like oftentimes coaches aren't knowing the it, it's two things right either they don't know ahead of time or it's like hey the day of i kind of get it published and i figure out what yeah. my programming is or it's like okay it publishes on sunday but i'm not going to wait until sunday to do your program design like right. I, I have a life so it's like <laughs> it's not realistic to expect the coach to to modify everything all the time. So it's like, you need to be able to pull an audible at times and figure out what's best for you. And okay. You did 75 chest bars in class. How about you don't do strict pull-ups today? Like your, yeah. your lats are toasted. Yeah. yeah and I, I think day hit it on the head and, and actually you did too. Like, so the first thing, the first part of that conversation for people who are like, I want to take class is, depending on the individual, I may or may not be willing to give a little, right? So like right. if I have a new client, like I, yeah, that's a good I point. if I have a new client and they're like, oh, I have to do class on the, on this day, I'll usually start by giving on one day. And it's usually Saturday partner workout Saturday. Right. And it's like, all right, cool. You can do that. Just know, like, sorry, you, you need might to do have, the name again. Yeah. Like <laughs> you might need to adjust some of these things. And then usually what happens is that person if their goals are purely athletic, like I want to be the best CrossFit athlete I can, eventually they stop doing that because eventually they realize that it's like, you know, beating Susan in this workout is really not helping me get to my goals. It's like, just because you beat the the 45 year old house mom doesn't make you better at the sport of CrossFit. Right. Um, and that's a conversation I'm, I'll have is like, Hey, all right. I don't know. Susan going. throws down. She's rich. She, she does. She, Susan she, does throw down. Though. Yeah. It's usually with burpees and V ups, like she crushes those. <laughs> um, so, so it's like okay, cool. But then there's also the conversation of like, if someone's like, no, like, this is my life, then it's like, all right, well, then you, it's kind of got to be your life. And every once in a while, it's okay to take class to get into the environment of like a group because that does help you push. I don't care what anyone says, being a part of a group does help you push at times. Um, but it has to be strategic. And then on the other end, to use this person as an example, she's a gym owner. And so like, she wants to be better at the sport, but not the, but not at the expense of her livelihood. And so it's like for her community, if it's important for her as a business owner to take class once or twice a week, or that's all her schedule can allow her to do, like her space is pretty small. So if like she's coaching classes during the day and she's like, this is the hour I have to work out and it's during a class. And so like, I can't go and do my thing on the side. Then it's like, all right, I'll work around that. But that's part of the conversation. And Again, with her, Ben, like she writes the programming for her gym. So part of the first mm. conversation I had with her was That's like a much better you, situation. Yeah. I was like, I need you to send me what the workouts are for Monday and Thursday by this day every single week. If I don't get it by this day, I'm not putting it into your program and you're gonna have to figure it out yourself. 
And she was like, okay, no problem. So I wouldn't do that if it was like, oh, I go to XYZ gym and we just get our programming from mayhem. It's like, well, I have literally no idea what you're going to be doing. And there's a really high chance they're going to get hurt. Same thing. Like I've done it for people at our gym. I approve all the programming for our gyms. So it's like, I have complete access to what the workouts are going to be. So if I don't have instant access to what the workouts are going to be at your gym, it's like pretty hard for me to say, okay. Cause it's like, there's a pretty good chance you're going to have some sort of injury pop up then. Yeah. Cool. Um, day go for it. All right. Sweet. So the athlete that I have up here, it's, um, right before quarterfinals. Well, it's in quarterfinal season. And his big thing was he's a strong guy. I didn't really have to worry about that, especially lower body. He was a former rugby player. Um, he needed some work on his Olympic lifting, but he had the strength for them. So it was just more touching up on the refinements and all that. There was a, a room for improvement there. Um, but the main thing that we wanted to focus on was his conditioning. And that's both in both realms. Like he needed a good endurance foundation um, as well as like for like lactic in the role intervals and more high intensity stuff. So that was our main focus and being able to, um, compete the, in those met cons, um, and be able to sustain those efforts and repeated bouts. So with him, it was, it was good to work with him. He, he was young. He did have a full-time job, but had, um, was a very structured job where he had time to after work and it was very routine so there was not a lot of things popping up and i know sometimes it's difficult with people who have kids or let's say a personal trainer who sometimes has like sporadic things come up on their on their calendar and their schedule so his was really nice it was routine um young guy just graduated college so there was not a lot like there was no kids or uh, those type of commitments so um the way i structured it with him um, working Monday through Saturday with two lower intensity days, two to three high intensity days and one moderate. With him, um, I noticed after a few weeks of working with him was that he tended on high intensity days, his resting heart rate was shut up for the following like two to three days um, and he didn't recover as fast. So keeping that in consideration, I would try to space out those high intensity days. Um, throughout the week. So if I were to give like a breakdown of his week, his Monday, he, that's where we would add in uh, morning conditioning. And that's just zone two longer periods of time, anywhere from 30 to 70 minutes. Um, and that was of his choice in terms of what he wanted to use. If you wanted to use a rower, bike, running, more like put on a podcast or listen to nature or do something and just, you know, focus on breathing. That was the main thing. And that he was good with that, wasn't as taxing. And so the, the PM session, we did some um, strength work for the lower body, mainly deadlifts. His squats was was uh, his strong point. So we focused a little bit more on deadlifts. Um, some skill met cons, which was handstand walking and bar muscle up, uh, handstand walking on this day. And then accessory was thing uh, more flexion work for the core, GHD sit-ups, um, and rotator cuff work since he tends to have a lot of rotator cuff issues. And so on that day, Monday, that was more of his high intensity day since the heavy, the heavy deadlifts and the Metcon really work in for that. So on the following day, we did some easy skill work and um, Olympic lifting cleans more on focusing on skill refinement on that. So it was more moderate that day. I, I'd call that more of a moderate training day. We added in some front squats on those cleans as well. Um, moderate, something to maintain his um, squat, but I was as a complex with his power cleans and all that. So, and his squat cleans. So that day was more moderate for him and it was able to allow him to recover from the previous day. Then we got on Wednesday here, um, the upper body, it was more upper body pressing strength. Um, when we built, we were working on bench prep press specifically some lactic intervals with monostructural work, gymnastics, um, 
and weightlifting and so barbell cycling and some accessory work for his psoas and medial elbow. So again, those accessory works that I put at the end, that's very specific based on, you know, where someone is weak in or if they're having any type of injury or nagging pains or anything like that. So that was more of a high intensity day. Then we moved on to Thursday, which is more, that's where his recovery was, his one of his recovery days. And that's just more zone two work, more of like the recovery hours that we do with SOAR, where we put in some zone two work, some core, some easy movements, carries, things like that. Um, adding some variety week to week just to, you know, add variety. Um, and I did that on Thursday just because the first, we had high intensity, a moderate, another high usually by this time at the end of the week, there's a lot of volume accumulated. People get tired. Um, I look at data. So resting heart rate tends to get high. HRV is low. So that's where I put in that recovery hour just to be like, Hey, it's the end of the week. You're probably tired mentally, physically, you know, let's make it easy. Just go, just move, focus on that. Try to get something out of it. Like the zone two um, stuff and um, go from there so that we can kind of relax the body a bit because on Friday rolls around and, and this specific week that I'm looking at, it was another high intensity day. So we start off with um, Olympic lifting snatches. Um, obviously putting that first when he's nice and fresh in the in the session. And then following with a Metcon that focused more on lower body endurance. Since that was something that also um, he needed to work on. It was one of our uh, things we noticed was that in most Metcons, I had like a lot of high rep, lower body work, whether it was like a hinging, like a lot of kettlebell swings, a lot of um, GHD sit-ups, a lot of Olympic lifting, barbell cycling. He tend to feel it in his back or if it was a lot of squats, lunging, um, he would feel it as well and some grip accessory. And then Saturday, try to keep that pretty easy. Um, so I like to go from high, moderate, low usually. And so on Saturday, I, I do something called like a high performance recovery training day. And it's just something that has mo uh, starts off with some breath work, followed by mobility, some heart rate focus intervals um, with skill, some med ball slams, variations, um, and some type of erg. And it's an interval style um, that keeps it at a zone two pace, followed by some uh, something easy that's focused on um, like power, concentric power. Um, so in this one, I would have like a few sets of concentric split squats. So kind of taking the eccentric part out just to focus on that, making it explosive and speedy. So it's not taxing on the system. It won't get, um, won't get them sore or anything like that, but it's focused on output, um, followed by. Is that they're just like, like concentric biased or is it like, uh, are you like starting in the bottom position? Yeah, starting like at the bottom position on pins, right? Gotcha, okay. Just exploding up. Exactly. And so I would do things like that with concentric split squats, um, pin presses, all that. Yeah. Gotcha. And then um, the end of that session, we would add in something like uh, 10 to 15 minutes easy bike. So very focused on, um, I try to put everything in that where it's like oh, that whole session was mobility, heart rate focused intervals power work and ending it with some type of zone two easy zone one zone two work yeah you're kind of hitting everything but not uh in a way that's like incredibly taxing right and it's just a way to end off the week sunday was off for him so it was like that was the easy way to end off um and it's more focused on like power uh, on output in general sunday yep. off and then revamp back on monday how often do you put a low day before like a, a rest day recovery day I, I do it kind of often, um, just because I've noticed some people get pretty fried and that's pretty fried at the end of the week. So I tend to do it at the end of the week where people still want to train on Saturday, but they're so fried from the week prior, um, from work, from training. So I do something on Saturday that's low and like not as uh, much impact or anything like that. And then off on Sunday. So you get that full two rest. Cause I do like to put a high intensity on Monday. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like everybody just does like throws one, one rest day and, and then it's like, all right, you're back to work, which like sometimes just right. like reality is like people need more than one day for something to recover. Yeah. And I know, um, one thing that is 
that I've read a lot, seen a lot, is that men tend to require more rest than women. So, and it's interesting because that's how it is with um, all most athletes I work with. It's like the men require like a little bit more rest periods, uh, rest days than the women do. And I don't know, there's, I've looked at your readings about it and it's like, there's different reasons why speculations but one is that men tend like when they're given like an intensity like hey do this at this intensity they tend RPE to actually stick eight. to it. yeah rpe8 it's like they go for rpe10 and they really push themselves that way but then there's also yeah. the hormonal response from women versus men that require that allow women to recover quicker mm -hmm. so that's why like when you look at athletes who taper for a sport or something like that, the women tend to taper less than the men. Interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm convinced that I'm a woman. <laughs> I'm convinced <laughs> that I'm a man. I need more recovery. <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I, I feel like one more factor might be the fact that like, you know, men are just handling a little bit of higher absolute loads. So it's a little bit more yeah. wear and tear at times. Um, right. And, or they're able to like just get more volume in, in a particular movement. And, and like, like cross, it's a good example. Like, you know, if you give, you know, a 10 minute AMRAP of thrusters and chest bars, the average male in the population is just going to get a little bit higher total work and then female. Yeah. So yeah. And can I potentially be a little bit more wear and tear. Yeah. And I don't know if you notice this at like your gym, but like, if you have like the workout structured a certain way, and let's say you're not giving rest intervals, you're just saying, okay, you're going to complete three sets of five back squats, you know? And then I don't know if you notice this, but like when I would do group classes, the guys would always take way longer because they needed that rest because they're going like they're lifting way more absolute load and more relative load. You're saying too. strength work or? Yeah, strength work. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, 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 would, if... it would take longer to finish that block. Yeah, for example, if it was like, you know, five by five squats, uh, and we just didn't give them like any constraints, just like, hey, get through your five by five. I mean, there might be some women who just get chatty and that's why they take forever. But generally, I feel like the women would probably move through a lot quicker than the men. Right. Like the men would be like lifted, like going every like three to four minutes and the women would be going right. like every 90 seconds. They just do their next set. Yeah. I think part of that too is just like it, like maybe – some of it could be cultural as well, where it's like guys, it's, they often want to lift like really heavy. Yeah. Whereas like some of the women are like, and, and this is much less the case than it was 10 and 20 years ago, but it's like mm -hmm. some women are still just like, yeah, I'm, I don't really need to push the weights. I'm just like pretty comfortable. Like, you know, I'll, I'll do my strength work, but it's, it's not like my, you know, blood vessels are ready to burst. Yeah. And I think some of that could be hormonal as well, but yeah, yeah. for sure. Cool. Um, yeah, I'll go through my athlete. Um, so this is a teen CrossFit athlete, uh, a male. And like most male teen CrossFit athletes who are aging up into the individual division, they just need to put on strength and size. So no different here. And I, I guess... Even if I have had a teen athlete come to me and they're like, hey, I want to peak for, you know, this year's, you know, teen CrossFit Games or something. Um, I probably would only take that so far where, like, I'm, I'm just maybe a little bit more risk averse for a, a teen just because they, like, they don't, they don't know what they don't know. And yeah. they, they, uh, like, I feel a bit of responsibility as, a, like, a, uh, you know, a coaching and fitness professional to like, you know, uphold their, their health, uh, frankly. Yeah. And like their, their long-term, um, you know, physiology, even if they don't really care about it. Um, yeah. cause at some point down the road, they probably will. So I think for all my younger athletes I train, I try to prioritize the long-term a little bit more, but not so much that the person becomes disengaged in what they're doing because they, they just don't enjoy their training. So it's like, <laughs> I said, this is somebody else on a call, but this is related to a master's athlete. Actually. It's like, you got to give like the addict a little bit of what they want, you know, just give them a little hit. Yeah. But at the same time, like you have to be 
you know, you're at the end of the day, you're responsible to making sure that they improve through program design. So you need to uh, put safeguards in place to make sure that they're, they're getting what they need and also just enough of what they want that they keep coming back and at least long enough until they trust you. And now you can say like, Hey, you don't need this. Um, so all, all that to say is like, you know, this person is still doing a lot of CrossFit. However, um, there's just some of the things that are oriented a little bit longer term and, there's going to be certain things that, uh, you know, I'm only willing to push, um, you know, weights so aggressively or, and, and truly it's not that much different than regular program design, but um, I guess it, it is with like a little bit longer term view of like, you need, in order to be competitive, you need to continue to push the strength over the long term, just because everybody needs to do that. But then also mm -hmm. like, we need to continue to put on strength and size in order to do that. You also need to be just slightly below you're probably your max recoverable volume. So all those things being caveats, let's go through. <laughs> um, Monday, uh, I really like giving weightlifting positional work or just weightlifting work in terms of like snatch and clean and jerk on Mondays, just because people are fresh. They're coming off a rest day for the most part. So it's like um, when that's the case, joints usually feel pretty good. Nervous system usually feels pretty good. So give them, um, yeah, like a, a pretty strong dose of uh, strength work on that day. Um, so Monday snatch positional work. And then afterwards we'll do a Metcon with a uh, barbell cycling. That's meant to be strength limited. Oftentimes if I'm doing barbell cycling, it's more capacity based work if someone's already got the strength, but, and, and generally I'll also say that like, I don't give a lot of uh, strength limited Metcons for people who are strength limited. Like usually it's like, do your strength work, get a good dose of your strength work. And then once you're strong enough, we'll start to mix in heavier weights in your Metcons. Um, this is one of the exceptions to that just because, um, you're going to have to handle those loads in that cons coming up. So getting, being aware of your capacity now that we're continuing to build strength is going to be helpful for you. And then some hamstring accessory that was, um, more so, uh, or posterior accessory, including hamstring. That's more like hypertrophy based. So like things like RDLs, glute ham raises, hip extensions, sores and holds. So that's Monday. Um, and then Wednesday would probably be the next day. If I skip over Tuesday, it would be like the next day where he's getting like a, a stronger lower body dose again. Uh, Tuesday is more upper body related. Um, there's still some metabolic work on that day, but it's, it's yeah, something that's either going to be a little bit more hanging gymnastics and or pressing based or like burpees and ergs and things where you, you, even if you're getting that systemic work rate, it's not going to be necessarily eccentric on the lower body, like rowing an air bike is not going to mess you up the same way that like hang squat cleans will. Um, so Tuesday, um, he's working on strict wearing muscle up. So again, some of that, and then some hang gymnastics and pressing work. That's just like unfatigued sets of things. Um, in this case, it was like strict and kipping parallel handstand pushups, uh, bar muscle ups where he's catching as high as possible. Um, and then often going into intervals that are like, or, or a Metcon that's, uh, like an erg and burpee power based thing. Um, cause again, being a smaller athlete, ergs are going to be tough. And, um, for this athlete, we identified as burpees also being one of his, uh, few body weight limited, uh, yeah, a, a body weight movement that's limiting for him. And then some like hip flexor and core stuff, because that's probably the reason why that's limiting for him. I uh, kind of alluded to that once I was, um, squatting and then, actually put two metcons in this day which i very rarely do it's usually like a metcon and maybe some like earth based conditioning or like intervals in a metcon this one is metcon and metcon which is again pretty rare um but it's also because there's not a lot of conditioning in the rest of the week so it's front and back squats and then a metcon that's involving rope climbs and barbell cycling um and that's and that's barbell cycling that's like more of a, a lighter to moderate weight and then another metcon that's just like featuring an odd object of some kind so um you know, a yoke, a sandbag, farmers, can carries, um, you know, dumbbells, kettlebells, that sort of thing. Thursdays is low day. Um, and I also give us a little bit of handstand skill work on that day. That's unfatigued Friday back to uh, weightlifting work. So power cleans and plyometrics deadlifting. So that's much more focused on, um, like posterior strength and power, um, as well as like time and retention for true deadlift because his, Olympic lifts relative to power lifts, uh, like, you know, speed, strength, uh, strength, speed versus, uh, absolute strength is pretty good. So continuing to build absolute strength and like the musculature to support that. So deadlifts, in other words, 
um, some single leg work, either usually like a, a box step up, weighted box step up of some kind or step over lunge of some kind. Um, and then some accessories for core and upper. Um, and then Saturday's the name game for him, which varies right now. It's like strict pulling and jerk work, um, squatting. And then, yeah, the name game, whatever that is. So. Awesome. Was this, I don't, I don't know if I, you mentioned, is it off season and season for him? Uh, is he doing a sport outside? Yeah. Of um, yes, he, but not right now. Um, maybe a little bit of off season stuff, but I don't even think he's got any off season stuff right now. So it's very, his commitment outside of this. So he's going to school. Um, and when we were doing, when we were in the summer, he was doing a few double days just cause like responsibilities were less than times a lot more. Um, mm. but again, being strength limited, being that he's in school, I'd rather have him sleep and eat a lot right. and continue to put on size and strength. Cause you only need to train so much to do that. Um, but not a lot of other responsibilities. Um, yeah. From like sports or that sort of thing. Yeah. And you mentioned, cause he's, you mentioned before, right? Like, working with a young athlete you got to be careful with that like you don't want them to specialize so early because they have so many like athletic qualities that you need to develop like and that's what you know i think is becoming more and more common is people are starting to like become very skilled in a sport and they lose the general athletic qualities they should have and you see these athletes coming up they're going to college to play tennis or whatever and they're great at their sport but you ask them to tumble and they can't tumble right they can't even do a simple tumble they can't do a cartwheel and those are like yeah. athletic qualities that like generally for like adults I don't i'm not putting like tumbling in the warm-up or anything like that mm -hmm. um most of the time if i have like a just a, a working adult who i'm working with like they just want to feel strong be strong they want to go work out in a gym so um they don't have like aspirations to become like some type of athlete, like CrossFit Games athlete or something like that. Some do, um, but for a, a younger athlete, and at like they need to have those things. They need to have the body awareness. They need to um, be able to do simple things like that. Be exposed to all these areas. Um, have relative body strength before they start benching with a barbell, doing heavy squats with a barbell so yeah um, and even teen athletes that. vary a lot in terms of like yeah. the exposures they've had to like traditional strength conditioning where they've abided by sound principles for a while and now they're um engaging in something like crossfit versus someone who didn't have that background they just jump right in across it um their compensations are just going to be a little bit different uh typically yeah. someone who's learned how to hinge squat press pull in the bro sesh way <laughs> is gonna you know there, there's maybe gonna be other things that they struggle with maybe like body awareness or um you know uh you know rotational power or something right but it's like at least they know how to move pretty effectively without just like thinking of reps as you know getting as many as you can at least amount of time yeah like there's always going to be weird compensations that come up when you race exercise um from yeah across it yeah 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 i don't know like part of it too is like yeah, you know, the the things that keep an athlete healthy, I think, can also be the things that keep them engaged in their training. Like, mm -hmm. you know, learning to do new skills or you know, practicing your same skills that you have, but maybe in a slightly different way. For example, in this week, I gave him rising ring muscle ups, which is never something I've, you know, I don't give athletes a lot. I don't practice that much, but it's like a little tweak of like a movement, right? Where it's like just enough, where it's like it, it's a new way to think about it and try it out. I'll give like like as I said like handstand skill work. So it was like on this day it was, you know, handstand walking to a wall, um, freestanding handstand pushup practice, you know, uh, static holds on parallettes, things like that. Right. Where it's like, all right, obviously that needs to be tailored to the level of athlete to a degree, but the more exposures you have of just like variance, um, with it being like within reason where it's like the person has a lot of the prerequisites they need to, to learn the new thing but it's like close enough where they can like enjoy it and feel engaged. Um, I think it's all helpful for developing other athletic qualities, but then also just like enjoying your training. Yeah. Like if you, 
early in my career as a coach, I was very much of the mindset of like, these are the 20 movements that are coming up in the open. You want to get to, you know, the next level. And that case was like regionals. It was like, okay, if you want to go from the open to regionals, you have to be really good at the open. Nothing else matters in terms of like movement selection. So you're not going to run, you're not going to air bike. You're not going to do, you know, dumbbell movements before like 2017 or whatever they came out. It's like, you're just going to do this stuff and you're going to get really good at it, which I think to a degree is good. But then also it's like, as soon as you do level up your game, you now have these like huge, hole, huge holes that you need to fill where it's like, you never really regret working on skills that are slightly outside of like the scope of what you're asked to do like right now. Yeah. I, and that's, that makes, that's a good point. Cause like that, I think that's what CrossFit does right with like youth training is like, the variety is great. The, all the different skills that you have to acquire, like there's a lot of play time of yeah. learning these skills. And that's great for an athlete. Like they need that. Um, that's like what kids, that's what you want kids to do growing up when they're playing outside and all that. It's like they're running, they're sprinting and like they're acquiring all these athletic general skills, um, without, the thought of them actually like being on a structured program, you know? Um, so yep. I think they do that. Right. And you mentioned it like, yeah, if you, like you said, like you focus on quarterfinals and then you worry about the skills after, but if you're working all these different qualities, like those skills will may even come naturally. Like I have one athlete, she's just, she's a freak. Like she's, she's awesome. She could, you could ask her to do anything and she'll do it. And we were warming up the other day. And not the other day, I think it was like last year, actually, uh, you know, same thing. Um, <laughs> but she was, we were talking about handstand walking and she's an endurance athlete and she's like, ah, oh, I've never handstand walked before. And she just <laughs> oh, like goes on her hands and just starts walking on them. Like just handstand walks like effortlessly. And I'm like, you know, she has years of just, I think she did gymnastics when she was young for like a few years. Like, you know, she has really great genetics too. So that helps. Um, but you know, that didn't take long. Meanwhile, me, I, I, I didn't have an athletic background that took me like a year and a half to learn. And that was like yeah. three to four days a week focusing on handstand walking. Yeah. So, unfortunately not yeah. a level playing field. Yeah. 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 For sure. Yeah. Last thing I'll say is like, if you, if you got a young person and they're doing CrossFit, it's like, as long as you put some either intelligent program design in place or just like, you know, a not even like a super qualified set of eyes, just like a set of eyes there that are like kind of like like, hey, maybe that looks like that that isn't gonna be super great if you do that for the next 10 years. Like that bar muscle up, yeah, chicken winged it pretty bad. Like if you do that 20 times in this workout for the next five years, you're gonna be in a bad place at some point. It's like, yeah. If you can just do that, like, hey, you know, you're you're clearly moving poorly. Let's mm -hmm. let's work on that, right? And not when you're super tired. It's like you're gonna just avoid so much. Where it's like I feel like the only time where, and this is where like it probably happens too much, and that's why in some cases like cross will get a bad rap for like you know just general training, but also youth training. It's like where someone has like really obvious compensations, and then because they're so tired in the workout, they just continue to reinforce the same thing again and again. It's like you know, the, this, the way you're moving is you're getting the work done, but at the complete cost of like your long-term yeah, longevity. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely see that a lot. Local comps. Scary, yeah. The local comp scene thing. is the perfect example of that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Unfortunately. It's, it's scary. Um, I think that's where a good coaching comes in, you know, or just an extra set of eyes. Yeah. Or, or somebody to be objective with themselves. And it's like, again, as a adult, when there's a kid in the room, it's like, okay, that's, that's your responsibility. At a certain point though, it becomes the, the athlete's responsibility. Like you're, you're old enough to understand that if you do this, you're going to get hurt doing it. Like if you, if you choose yeah. to, you know, continue to overhead squat and you don't ever work on your overhead mobility and your T-spine's locked in place because you have a desk job that you sit at for 60 hours a week. You're gone and get hurt at some point, right? And if yeah. you understand that and you're willing to for those consequences, okay, go for it. But just know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. No, I totally agree. I think skeletons, um, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. We were supposed to talk about skeletons. <laughs> hey, we did get through our three examples. Um 
So yeah, yes. I mean, if people got questions, they got follow up stuff, um, or if they want us to talk about, maybe we'll talk revisit like masters and youth. Um, yeah, you know some specific demographics, but yeah, let us know if you got questions. Yeah, for sure. Sweet. Thanks, Dave. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for listening today. If you're someone who just started listening to the show, I would encourage you to subscribe so you can stay up to date. If you're someone who's been listening for a while, I would encourage you to rate and review the show. And lastly, the best thing that you can do to support our work is also the best thing that you can do for your performance. And that is by hiring one of our coaches. Until next time, stay the course.